For an analysis of today's news of the European situation, <laughs> Columbia now presents H.V. Kaltenborn, distinguished news analyst. Mr. Good Kaltenborn. Good evening, everybody. Let's begin with Romania. General George Argeshanu, commander of the Bucharest Army Corps and former Minister of War, tonight was named Premier, replacing the slain Prime Minister, Arman Karinescu. That means that they're going to have a military government as strong a government as King Carroll could possibly create, and it needs to be strong in view of the situation faced by imperiled Romania. Russian armies are menacing from the north. German armies are menacing from the west. Logically, an adventure in Romania is the next step for both Russia and Germany. Germany needs the oil, needs the wheat that Romania has. Germany remembers the low world war, when she succeeded in overrunning Romania, she was able to exploit Romania's new resources to her own advantage. Russia remembers that Romania, after the war, took her province of Bessarabia, not peopled by Romanians. She has never relinquished that province, and it's perfectly natural to assume that perhaps, beyond their agreement on Poland, that Stalin and Hitler have also arrived at an agreement with respect to Romania. It would be perfectly natural as the first step in the execution of an attempt to change the policy and purpose of the Romanian government that they should try to eliminate Kalinescu, who was anti-Nazi, anti-Iron Guard, and it is Iron Guardists who have assassinated him and substitute a regime that would exercise at least benevolent neutrality towards Germany and towards Russia. It is quite possible that the events in Romania today are the first planned step in whatever Germany and Russia intend to do. The creation of a new strong government and the Romanian government's refusal to admit any political implications of what has happened today are an indication that that government realizes that it is fighting for its life. It naturally does not admit the political implications because to do so would be a slap in the face against Germany, a slap in the face against Russia, and little Romania, seeing what has happened to Poland, does not feel that it can afford to take any chances with offending either. However, the question arises whether the mere passive attitude of not offending will suffice to maintain Romanian integrity. The next week's will show. Both the British and the French governments have evidently deemed it of considerable importance to answer Adolf Hitler, Hitler's address. The British government answered once again today, pointing out the inconsistencies and what it calls the lies of Adolf Hitler. And this afternoon, at a time that was not particularly well chosen, certainly from the point of view of reaching general public attention, Edouard Daladier speaks in answer to Hitler. He spoke at the same time as the President of the United States. And you will remember that Colombia's microphone had to omit bringing part of Daladier's address because we were still bringing to you the words of the President of the United States, which obviously are more important to us at this particular time. Prime Minister Daladier could have attracted much more attention to his address could have had a much larger audience for it if he had postponed it for a day or two. The fact that he gave it today indicates that the French felt it important that the message should reach the French people at once. It is possible that German propaganda, which we must admit has always been efficiently organized, has made some use of Hitler's appeal to the French poilu. It's quite possible that there has been a large distribution of certain sentences from Hitler's address to the French army by means of leaflets or by other ways which are easily possible at the front where soldiers are as close together as they are between Germany and France and that it was felt in France that an effective, eloquent answer such as Prime Minister Dalaji gave today was the thing to do. At any rate, that would be one explanation for his speaking at the very same time as the President of the United States. Now, what about the President's address? I spent a good part of yesterday in Washington. I interviewed members of the cabinet, outstanding leaders of the Senate, some of the most outspoken leaders 
of the opposition to lifting the embargo and got a picture of the atmosphere of Washington. There is general apprehension in Washington that somehow, in some way, in spite of our not wanting it, that the country may be pushed towards war. I was much surprised to find that apprehension, but it exists. And I noticed that the dominant thing to me in the President's address is his continuous insistence that he is determined to keep us at peace. He mentioned that not once but half a dozen times in the course of the address, and each time that he mentioned it, he received an enthusiastic response from the audience to which he was speaking. He began with the assumption that every man who listened to him was in favor of keeping the United States out of war, and again and again... In the course of his talk, he recurred to that and embodied that idea in a number of pregnant phrases which will be quoted again and again. The substance of his address, as you know, was an appeal for the repeal of the embargo on munitions. And he made it very clear that there is no embargo on anything in the way of war material outside of munitions. That's a point of distinction that I found was not even in the minds of some of the leading senators who are discussing this problem. That is, the distinction is not as clear as perhaps it should be, and I note that the President emphasized it again and again. Let us be factually said and recognize that a belligerent nation often needs wheat and lard and cotton for the survival of its population just as much as it needs anti-aircraft guns and anti-submarine depth charges. Let those who seek to retain the present embargo position be wholly consistent and seek new legislation to cut off cloth and copper and meat and wheat and a thousand other articles from all the nations at war. I seek a greater consistency through the repeal of the embargo provisions and a return to international law. It happens that yesterday I asked Senator Nye whether he would favor an entire, a complete embargo on everything, and Senator Nye answered frankly and directly, I would. But he is the only senator from whom I have received such an expression. And there is the question about which the debate is going to center. Is it logical to embargo, as the president put it, certain products of industry which happen to be in the shape of munitions and not embargo all the products of industry that do not happen to be completed as munitions. And the president, you remember, spoke of a whole series of articles that are partly manufactured that are going to be used for munitions if we continue to export them, but that don't happen to be in the condition of munitions. Now, a bulletin has just come in from the United Press which states that the Senate isolationists intend to fight President Roosevelt's neutrality revision program, and now I quote, from hell to breakfast, which seems to be the phrase which they used after a strategy meeting in the office of Senator Hiram Johnson, Republican of California. Well, that is their privilege. Those men are sincere. I talked with enough of them yesterday to realize how sincere and how determined they are. Senator Vandenberg was extremely frank in pointing out that he felt that to remove the embargo on munitions would be the first step towards war. And he said, after we take the first step, the second step is much more easy. But I talked to another outstanding Republican leader who takes a different point of view, a man whose voice would be even more important in determining American opinion when that voice will make itself heard. And here is the way he put it to me. We should help nations to defend themselves against attack. We should not help any attackers. I do not believe for a moment that we can maintain an effective embargo on arms. Italy can remain neutral and buy all the tanks and bombing planes and heavy mobile artillery and poison gas she pleases. She can guarantee that she will not export a single unit to Germany. All she needs to do is to export to Germany all that she now has and all that her factories can produce. Here is another consideration. Scores of American manufacturing plants will transfer their factories to Canada if we maintain the arms embargo. We will manufacture parts, machines, various raw materials. They will be shipped to Canada and assembled there. I had hoped that Hitler's talk might provide a basis for peace. It does not look so now. I am afraid we are in for a long war. It is a great misfortune that this country has divided on this pupil embargo issue. 
The chief reason for it is that some members of Congress do not trust the president. There is one way in which he could regain the complete confidence of Congress and the country. He could do it by simply coming out and announcing that he does not propose to run for a third term, but I don't expect to see him do that. And after I had interviewed this leading Republican and gotten that statement, I went to one of the outstanding friends and advisors of the president, and I asked him why would or could the president not announce that he was not a candidate for a third term. And here is his reply. In the first place, it would reduce the president's hold on Congress. In the second place, it would decrease the president's influence with the Democratic Party. Don't expect the president to speak out upon this subject before next spring. And remember this, he added, the president can prevent the nomination of any Democrat whom he opposes. And secondly, no Democratic candidate for the presidency can be elected next year without the president's active support. There you have the opinion of men who are in perhaps the best position to speak. And yet, we have had the emphasis throughout the session of Congress, throughout the Everything that has been said within the last 48 hours, the emphasis upon the desire to maintain national unity. And yet, we're in for a fight. It's a sincere fight. It's an honest fight. Now this group of 24 senators of various political faiths that met this afternoon, they heard the president's neutrality speech. They obviously took account of what he said. And then they assembled in the same room where 20 years ago, 19 senators met to adopt the no-compromise position against Woodrow Wilson's plea for United States participation in the League of Nations. Senator Johnson, who was largely instrumental in keeping this country out of the League of Nations, said that in the forthcoming neutrality battle, he and his colleagues will not resort to filibuster tactics, but will nevertheless explore the issues thoroughly. And with reference to that, I also asked Senator Vandenberg whether he believed that a filibuster was in order. And here is his reply. There will be free and full debate upon this issue. It may take two weeks, or it may take six weeks here in the Senate. But I personally completely oppose anything in the way of a filibuster. The filibuster on this issue would justify those who say that the democratic processes will not work. But so long as the discussion pertains to the issues, so long as there is no attempt to drag in extraneous material, that discussion must go on. There can also be no cloture. And by cloture, he meant a vote of two-thirds of the members of the Senate to so limit debate that the final question would have to be put to a vote within perhaps 24 or 48 hours. He says there can be no cloture. They haven't got the votes to force cloture. Now, I believe, he added, that we must keep the embargo because to change it now would be a step towards war. And Senator LaFollette of Wisconsin, in discussing what happened today after the meeting of the isolationist adds this. He says, the milk in the coconut is the question whether the arms embargo should be repealed. On this issue, he said, and he is the one, it appears now, who used the quotation that I gave you a moment ago, on this issue, says Senator LaFollette, we will fight from hell to breakfast. End quote. Now, several of these isolationists are members of the Foreign Relations Committee, which is to meet to consider what should be done. But it was my understanding in Washington yesterday that in the Foreign Affairs Committee, the administration has a majority. They will make a report in line with the president's recommendation, and then the debate in the Senate will begin. Well, we're fortunate that we're at peace and that we can still have full and free debate on such an important issue. Good night. You have just heard H.V. Kaltenborn with an analysis of today's news of the European situation. Further broadcasts on the European war will be presented later in the evening. At 8.55 p.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time, the Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations will present their regular evening feature, Elmer Davis and the News. This is the Columbia 